Welcome to the Resurrection Baptist Church Love Study Group. Today is May 8th, 2020. Shut in, but not shut out. All right. There are 66 books in God's Holy Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Let's say them all together. Ready, set, go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. Amen. Amen. If you got a book that got 67 books in it, you don't have God's holy book. Mm. 66 books. Thank you, Lord, for your written word that reveals the living word. Today our lesson will come from a conversation that I was having with somebody that was talking about addictions. And I was going to ask Resurrection Baptist Church this question on Sunday as their question for the week, but I thought it's best that I get to it now. Reason being that with what we are enduring the challenge, the crises of the virus, with all of the tragedy, the affliction, people are scared and don't know what to do. We do what we naturally do, and that is seek to blame somebody. Hmm. We like to blame the president, the politicians. We like to blame people for anything and everything. It's called the blame game. Husbands blame their wives. For not being happy, wives blame their husbands for being unhappy. The children blame both of them because they are not getting their way. When we're in worship, the congregation blames the pastor. The pastor can blame the deacons. We like to play the blame game. What we're doing now with the virus, it is a problem. But it's not the president nor the politician's fault. It's all of our fault. Our problem is sin. Mm -hmm. Unconfessed sin. We don't like to confess. We like to find somebody that's at fault. So we like to play the blame game. But the solution is Jesus Christ. He's the only solution. We have a problem, and we have to confess that we have a problem, not be so full of pride to think that we could have done better or will do better and try to make it on our own. In the biblical record, 
since we're coming upon Mother's Day on Sunday. Now, I've been thinking about this all week. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, created by the Almighty God, sustained by the Almighty God, provided for by the Almighty God. They sinned. And when they sinned, they realized that they were both naked. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that they sewed fig leaves together and wore them as a covering the cover of their nakedness. The fig leaves are a representation of what we have even to this day. A self-made religion, a self-righteousness, a desire to be independent, live by our own rules and regulations. The fig leaves represent them. A desire to forget and forsake God and just make it on our own. That's what those fig leaves represent. And throughout the biblical record, you will always see that man has continued to pursue his own self-righteousness. I said it in worship all the time. We say it in our nursery rhymes, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great big fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. And then the answer comes back, why not ask the king to put us back together again? Because he's the one that made us. We live in a world today where there are whole congregations and a lot of Christian people who try to gain God's acceptance by their own self-righteousness. And throughout the biblical record, they misapply, misuse, and abuse what God is continually telling them. Let's read a couple of scriptures. In Genesis 3 and 7, Let's read that first to see the fig leaves. Genesis 3 and 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now keep reading it. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me, Listen to that blame game. She gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. 
both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and, and to dust, dust you shall return. Time. And the Lord sold fig leaves, sold coats of skin, and put them on our first parents. Notice that he took the fig leaves of their self-righteousness, of their independence, of their man-made religion, off of them. Throughout the biblical record, God has always and will always clothe his children. The question was asked the other day, when we get to heaven, will we get to heaven with the clothes that we were buried in? Think about that. Some people are buried in expensive suits with jewelry around their neck. I mean, we do all kind of things nowadays. We put magazines and stuff in coffins. But will we wear the clothes that we were buried in when we get to heaven? When you read the book of Revelation, John says that he saw in the spirit those that had washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb. And they all wore white robes. Once again, God clothed us because that's just the way our Heavenly Father is. But the point I want to make tonight is found in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, the 48th verse. Matthew 5, 48. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Man, years ago when I was 17, I had this question posed at a Bible class because even today a lot of people and a lot of newborn Christians try to attain God's approval and his acceptance by their self-righteousness. They give their life to Christ. They believe in his atoning sacrifice. They believe that he has washed all their sins away, which he has. And then they try to have a do-it-yourself religion. And what I mean by that is they misunderstand what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, 48. What did he mean when he gave the commandment? It's not a suggestion, but it's a commandment that we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And throughout the biblical record, we are commanded by the Almighty God to be perfect. Many people, once they give their life to Christ, and I want you to hear me good tonight. After they give their life to Christ, they make a list of I can do this, but I can't do that. They have do's and they have don'ts. Do's and don'ts. And the do's, they say, okay, I can do this, but I can't do that. And they try to obtain their own righteousness, their own perfection, just like Adam and Eve did back in Eden's garden. But what did Jesus mean when he gave us the commandment? What did he mean that we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect? What did he mean? 
Because after you have given your life to Christ and you make your imaginary list of, our, of the do's and don'ts, whether it be drinking, gambling, whoremongering, whatever it might be, you know, we got all these lists of sins. And then we say, okay, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that anymore. Only to find out as time progress, that eventually still in our hearts, we still want to do it. I say it all the time. There are some sins or some habits that we have that we still love. And that we're not able to change those habits with our own strength. Throughout the biblical record, God continually tells his people, I want you to be perfect. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19 verse 2. Leviticus 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. All right, go to Deuteronomy 18, verse 13. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Over and over again, he will repeat that. Even when we get to the book of Job, it will tell us that Job was a blameless and a perfect man, a perfect and upright man. And then when you read the story, you'll find out that Job wasn't so perfect after all. We don't understand. And so by the time we get to Matthew, 5 verse 48 which is part of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus gives the command to be perfect as our Father who is in heaven is perfect. We begin to look at ourselves in the mirror a self-examination we should and after we look at ourselves in the mirror we begin to look at others and we judge them. We say, oh, I remember when he used to do this. What you fail to realize is that all of us as Christian believers, whether we're Christian believers or not, have a past. All of us have a past. Paul picks up his pen by the aid of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would have him to write that we have all sinned and missed the mark. Not some all, but all have sinned. The first thing you got to understand is that when Jesus said this in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter and the 48th verse, he knew very well that it was an attainable standard. It was unattainable. It's unattainable for you and I to be perfect while we yet breathe and live and have our being. You don't live perfect. You don't understand what perfection really means. So a lot of people after they look at themselves in the mirror even after they have given their life to Christ, after a while they say, Shucks, I still want to do some of this. I still want to do some of that. I still have a desire to do that. And so they go ahead They go ahead, and they start doing what they had formerly been doing all along. And they recognize that they just can't stop on their own. You don't have a power within yourself to change your own life. 
It's unattainable. You can't make yourself perfect. No matter how you try, you can't make yourself perfect. The president might talk about a perfect call, but we found out it wasn't so perfect after all. He might even think of himself as a perfect president. But if you listen to him, you'll find out he's not so perfect. After all, no politician, no preacher, none of us are perfect. There's only one perfect person in all of the universe. And so you ask yourself, why would Jesus give us a command that he knew that we were not able to attain it. And that's what I mean by us having to look at ourselves in the mirror and view ourselves correctly. When we view ourselves correctly in the light of God's holiness, we'll find out that he is holy and we are not. Isaiah said that in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and his train filled the temple. He said, I saw the doorpost shout, glory to the Lord. I saw the angelic beings saying, holy, holy, holy. Then he recognized himself. When he gets down to the point and says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, meaning that I do a lot of cussing. And not only do I do a lot of cussing, but everybody that I know, everybody I hang around, everybody I listen to, they also cuss. I, 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 I just cuss. And so the Lord sends an angel puts a coal, a fiery coal on his mouth to change his speech. Oh, what a wonderful God we worship and serve. But what about this unattainable standard that God has set? Not only is it unattainable, our problem that we have is not the politicians. I ain't never asked the president in my life to protect me, to secure me, to provide for me. He can't. Somebody's providing for him. And so the thing we have to recognize is who our true creator is who our true provider is, who our true sustainer is. When Jesus said that, he was letting the people know that even though it's unattainable, I am the standard by which God has set everything. The Holy Spirit after he has convicted us of sin, spends time working on us so that we might have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, that he might change us inside out. No Christian, no matter how long they've been in worship, no matter how long they've been on the auxiliary board or did this or that. No matter how long you've been preaching or teaching. You haven't attained it. It's a process that the Holy Spirit has to take us through. To get us ready. to be with the Lord. And I don't think we quite understand that. Oftentimes I tell people when Moses was on 
top of the mountain receiving the law from God. At the bottom of the mountain, they were breaking the very commands that he was giving Moses on the top. Matter of fact, they were having a sexual orgy at the bottom. Their true nature came out. And then even after Moses came down and began to talk to him and give him the law, they said all that the Lord said we sh commanded that we should do, we're going to do it. Mm. And that same song is sung by a lot of people, even in worship today. We try to pin and make up our own righteousness. And so we still wear the fig leaves of our first parents instead of accepting the cloth, the clothing of the righteousness of Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. We read it all the time in revivals. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, have not what? And seeking to establish their own righteousness. And seeking to establish their own righteousness. And not submitted to the righteousness of God. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Which we have in Christ Jesus. Good God of life. And so what we do is we seek. And I'm here tonight to tell you. That the Christian relationship is a relationship of submission, is a relationship of serving, is a relationship of selflessness. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was equal with God, thought it not robbery, was willing to submit to the will of his father, even the death on the cross. Now God has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior. Our problem today is sin. And we're trying to live and attain something that we cannot obtain. And when we find out that we can't obtain, we don't even throw our arms up no one and say, what's the use? No, we just try to keep striving. Lord, I never reached perfection, but Lord, I tried. Lord, I tried. Lord, I tried. When all along, the perfection is in Christ. We must be clothed with his righteousness. We must... Allow the Father, the Holy Spirit, to take off the fig leaves of our self-righteousness, of our man-made religion, and have a true relationship. One thing that this virus has brought out and should bring out to all of us is that while we have a problem and we don't have a cure, we have a need for Jesus Christ more than ever before. He's the solution to our problem. 
while we're going to seek a vaccine. And we've been seeking a vaccine and a remedy for a lot of a man's ills. Think about this. What if tonight they decided we we're never going to find a remedy to the coal. So y'all stop buying all that coal medicine. CVS and Walgreens had to go out of business, wouldn't they? What if tonight we would confess, well, we don't know, we don't never, we ain't gonna never find the remedy to cancer. The doctors wouldn't be able to buy the big boats or the big houses. There would be no such things as chemotherapy. We're trying to fight against God and live our own way and have our own self-righteousness. And I see it all the time in people. They brag about what they are not doing and what somebody else is doing. And I thought about this. It's easy to see what other habits or what other addictions other people have. But what addiction do you have? What are you addicted to? There's a lot of people that sit and worship every Sunday thinking that they live in better lives than other people. And therefore God owes me. God is in debt to me. When all along... Pride is the worst sin you and I could ever have. A prideful person doesn't believe that they have a need for Jesus Christ. And so they try to live above Christ. Lucifer, I tell you that. I'm going to push God off his throne. I'm going to sit in the sides of the north. I'm going to be above all the angels of heaven. I'm going to be the commander in chief. One thing we got to understand about all the demonic spirits that roam the universe to this day. They had a beginning and they're going to have an end. They had a beginning and they're going to have an ending. And we got to understand that. Yes, we are at war. But the only way the war we're going to win the war is not by us finding or seeking our own remedy as our first parents did when they had sinned in the garden and disobeyed God and they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. It does not mean that we're supposed to sit around and do nothing. But what it is supposed to mean and what it should mean even today in this virus-laden culture that's gone around the globe that we ought to seek the face of God and come closer to Him and realize that He is holy and we are not. Realize that he is perfect and we are not. Unattainable. No matter how hard you try, you might look good on the outside, dressed up at worship on Sunday morning, but on the inside, you're a wolf. And God knows it. Because you will not submit. Will not submit. To the righteousness. Listen what the Holy Spirit says to us. In Philippians chapter 3. Verse 4 through 9. Philippians 3 verses 4 through 9. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. I got confidence in the flesh, which a lot of us do. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You and I, no matter how long we've been worshiping at our church buildings, we don't have any righteousness of our own. If you think you got righteousness of your own, you ain't going to never make it to heaven. This is the very thing that Jesus condemned the Pharisees of his day, the Sadducees of his day. These are the things that he condemned them for. They didn't see a need for him in their lives. We look at Jesus. We fast in two, three days out of the week. We pay all the tithes and give him proper offerings. We attend and worship, don't miss it. And Jesus would pronounce eight woes. Um, and I, well, I, I gotta have us read those woes because he's gonna give us a description of those woes. And when he gives us a description of the woes that is found in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, listen to what he says. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Matthew 4, what? I don't five. You said Matthew 5? Mm -hmm. You got it, Faith? It ain't there. Matthew 5? It's in 23. Oh, Matthew 23. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to see whether y'all were paying right, attention. Right, right, Matthew 23. Okay. You see it now? Yes, now. Matthew 23. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll start at verse 13 of Matthew 23. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you devour widows houses and for a pretense make long prayers therefore you will, they will make a long prayers keep going therefore you will receive greater condemnation woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you blind guides who say... They were blind guides. Who keep, say, I'm sorry. Who keep say, going. Who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind... For which is greater, mm. the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? One more. Yeah. Verse 18. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving. Yeah, done, done. Stop right there. Now, 
notice the things that the Pharisees were doing, but the things that they refused to do. And there are a lot of people to this day who are law unto themselves with the list of do's and don'ts. They try to obtain their own righteousness to gain their acceptance before God. When in reality, Jesus is the solution to our problem. Oh yeah, we got a problem. We got a problem. And our problem is greater than the virus. Hmm. The virus is just a symptom hmm. of a greater problem that's on the inside. A dirty heart and a heart that will not submit to Christ Jesus as the solution to our problem. Self-righteousness is going to send a lot of people to hell. That's what hell is going to be filled with. Self-righteousness. Don't you ever believe that you're going to be able to stand before the Almighty God and boast of your achievements or your goals. No, no. Only through Christ. He said you can't do nothing without me. You can't do nothing without him. And anything you do do, you do to the glory of Christ. Even when you read the stories of the lives of the people in the Bible who had faith, the object of their faith was Christ. That's who they had placed their trust in, that he's coming. The Bible even informed us that Abraham saw Christ and he rejoiced. Oh, yeah. He saw the day of Christ's coming and he rejoiced. Well, how did he see it, preacher? When God told him to take his only son, Isaac, up there. That's found in Genesis chapter 22. We ain't got to read that. Take the only son, the son I know you love, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice unto me. The Bible says that Abraham rose early in the morning. Got the wood and the sun and all that together. And started out on the journey. And the Lord said, here, right here, Mount Moriah. Take him up there and offer him as a burnt sacrifice unto me. The Bible says that he took his son and the son asked, Daddy, I see we got the wood, we got the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And Isaac, Abraham said to Isaac, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And what Abraham did not have to do God did do for the problem that we have in us. Stop sowing those fig leaves thinking that you better than somebody else just because you've been doing this and been doing that. Just because you look holy but on the inside it just ain't right. You ain't going to be able to boast before God the only person that's going to be able to boast is Jesus Christ. But that's why I read Revelation 5 all the time to you. That a search was made throughout heaven, on the earth, and even underneath the earth, of anybody that could come and take the scroll out of God the Father's hand. 
which is the title deed to the universe. Only one person, whether Abraham, or wasn't Isaac, it wasn't Jacob, it wasn't Samson, it wasn't David, it wasn't any of those people. Mm-hmm. Only Jesus. John said he saw a lamb. Lamb that looked like it had been slain before the foundation of the world. He stepped up and he took the title deed out of the Father's hand. Why? Because he is the solution to our problem. Now the reason why I'm saying this is we got a lot of self-made religion. We think that we can come to God with what we think is right in our eyes instead of what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And what we do is we offer him strange fire and he will not accept it. The God who created us, the God who redeemed us, the God who sustains us, the God who blesses us. He said, I am the God. Not only am I the God, not a God, but the God. This is how I want you to worship me. I laugh at people a lot of time when they say, well, this is my favorite song. Mm -hmm. What if it ain't God's favorite song? When we get to heaven, God ain't going to ask you what's your favorite song. He already have his songs already measured out for us. We don't even have to go to choir rehearsal. He got his songs. He got his way that he wants us to worship him with a contrite and humble spirit, a spirit that has submitted to him, that serves and worships him in the name of Jesus Christ. That's key. So let's go back. to Matthew 5 and 48. Matthew 5, 48. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now go to Romans 4. And as we close, read verse 1 through 8. Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... Now, don't get scared by the word justified, because the word justified is that justification means that he was made right before God. That's what justification means. Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about. If he was made right with God by his works, which he wasn't, keep reading. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Oh my goodness. Why? Because he takes off our self man made religion Hmm. and gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We can't obtain perfection, but Jesus did. That's why he took our sins upon himself. 
Notice our sins were on him, but not in him. Upon himself, out on Calvary's hill, on that cross, all of our sins, past, present, and future, on himself, out there on that middle cross, so that he might give us the righteousness, the gold standard, the unattainable that he had attained for us by giving us his righteousness because he was well pleasing in the eyes of his father. He reached up into heaven and took his father's hand, reached down there to us and brought us up out of the miry pit and reconciled us and reconnected us to the father. All we got to do is confess. What did the Holy Spirit tell us? That if we would confess our sins, that he would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can't cleanse myself. Mama used to tell me, only thing soap and water can't cleanse, boy, mm. is your soul. Only the blood of Christ. We sing it in worship all the time. It was the blood. Yes. Only the blood of Christ washes our sins away. You can get tired. You can get gain. It don't wash nothing away. You don't believe me? How many times have you washed your clothes since you've been shut in? We got to keep rewashing them. The reason why you attend worship is that God uses the word to wash you and I because we are always dirty. Cleanse our heart, cleanse our minds, cleanse our hands. And I ain't talking about physical. You're not going to get to heaven dressed with what you're buried in. That ain't good enough for heaven. The Lord got a robe that he's made just for you. Just for me. And that robe is the robe of righteousness that we have in Christ. Unattainable, yet someone has attained it for us. Yes. And that someone is Jesus Christ. Thank you, not mama, not daddy, not brother, not sister, not preacher, not deacon, not priest. Jesus. And Jesus only. Jesus plus nothing. Equals something. All to him I owe. That's what I say. All to him we owe. Thank you, Lord, and God bless you. Amen.